Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing angiogenesis in chronic inflammation. Okay, so, uh, we've just had a discussion of the three types of microvasculature blood vessel, the arterioles which lead to the capillaries, and then the venules. Okay, so we're now about to discuss the acute inflammatory response, which is also called the innate immune response. So. The acute inflammatory response is what we're going to talk about now. So basically, the acute inflammatory response is something that you will initiate in response to many different types of pathogens. It's something which is very generic. It's a generic response that is not specialized at all for the microbe or the pathogen that you're having to deal with. It's just the body's response to some problem, basically, in that tissue. Okay, now what does it involve? Well, basically, it involves three major components, okay? So it can be summarized into three major things. So the first thing is that you're going to cause vasodilatation of these arterioles here, okay? So the vascular smooth muscle cells um, around the outside of the arterioles that supply this affected area where we have this pathogen, those are going to relax, and when they relax, their lengths are all going to increase, basically. So the circumference of this ring of vascular smooth muscle cells that lines the basement membrane is going to go up, okay? And when the circumference of this ring increases, that means that the diameter of the ring also increases, so the whole blood vessel enlarges, basically, and this is known as vasodilatation. Okay, now what does what is the point of phasodilatation? What does it achieve? Well, basically, it's going to mean that we get an increased blood flow to uh, the affected area because when you vasodilatate these arterioles, more blood can flow through the lumens. So you're going to get more blood coming through here, filling up these capillaries, and then going through the venules. So you're going to get an increased blood flow to the affected area. Now, what is the point of that? Well, basically, in order to fight this pathogen, the peripheral tissue is not capable of doing that itself, at least not to any great extent. It does have uh, dotted around a few cells uh, which are capable of phagocytosing microbes called sentinel cells, such as dendritic cells and macrophages. But unless only a single bacteria or pathogen has managed to get in, they're not going to be able to deal with this themselves. Uh, they're really just there to initiate the acute inflammatory response. Okay, uh, so what you need to instead to do is recruit troops from the blood which are going to come and fight this pathogen. So there are many things within the blood which are capable of attacking this pathogen. Okay, so there are proteins within the bloodstream that are capable of attacking the microbe or the pathogen, um, and there are also cells known as white blood cells which are specialized for killing pathogens. And the fancy word for white blood cells is to call them leukocytes. Okay, so there are proteins and leukocytes within the blood that you want to move from the blood into the interstitial space so that they can then fight this microbe. Okay, now if we vasodilatate the arterioles leading to this uh, affected area, then we're going to get a greater blood supply there, and that means that we have a greater number of proteins and leukocytes arriving at the affected area. Now this leads to the affected inflamed area becoming red because blood is red and if you increase the blood flow to an area that's going to make the area redder and it also increases the temperature of the affected area so it makes the affected area uh, feel hot and the reason for that is that blood again is hot so for instance if you get a piece of your skin infected then you're going to get an inflammatory response there and this will cause that portion of skin to become hotter than usual because it's got blood, uh, more, a greater supply of blood than it would usually have. Okay, right, so that's the first thing that you do. The second thing you're going to do is increase vascular permeability. So increased vascular permeability is going to be the next move. Okay, so 
basically this is a change on the level of the endothelial cells, okay? So the endothelial cells lining the capillaries and the venules, the post-capillary venules here, are going to move apart, basically, so that we open up gaps between neighboring endothelial cells, okay? So you're going to open up gaps between neighboring endothelial cells. Now, when you open up gaps between neighboring endothelial cells, that's going to create gaps out of the bloodstream, basically. It's going to create little holes in the side of the capillaries and the post-capillary venules, uh, which is going to mean that fluid from the bloodstream can leave the bloodstream through these holes into the interstitial fluid, basically. So, the capillaries and the venules are going to become incredibly leaky, and fluid from the blood is going to be able to leave uh, the bloodstream and go into the interstitial fluid, okay? Now, this increased fluid that you're bringing in to the uh, interstitial space is what's known as an inflammatory exudate, okay? So it's called an inflammatory exudate, okay? And what is the point of this inflammatory exudate? Well, the point of it is to bring in all sorts of proteins from within the blood which are capable of attacking the microbe or containing the microbe. Okay, so there are many proteins that are circulating within the bloodstream that are in their inactive state at the moment, but if you bring them out and present them a microbe, or just bring them out in some cases, they will become active. Okay, now these holes that you produce in the, um, in the wall of the blood vessel, these are not big enough for cells to fit through, okay? So, uh, at least not without help. They're going to require extra help, and we'll come on to that in a moment. But they are big enough for proteins to move through. And what are two, some of the key proteins that you uh, move from the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid? Well, some key examples are the complement proteins, okay, which will come out of the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid, and there they will set up complement cascades which attack the pathogens. And these complement cascades are the same no matter what pathogen you are, basically. So they're a very innate uh, response, and that's the other name for the acute inflammatory response. It's also known as the innate response, and that's because it's inbuilt, basically. It doesn't change depending on what the pathogen is. It's the same response no matter what pathogen you have. Okay, so you'll bring in complement proteins, which are circulating within the blood in inactive forms, and when they find the microbe, they'll set up cascades which will attack that microbe. You're also going to bring in coagulation factors, okay? Now, as soon as you bring coagulation factors out of the blood, what will happen is you will set off the coagulation cascade. Coagulation factors have a very boring life. They go round the bloodstream, round and round and round and round, and they never see anything other than um, the contents of the blood and the apical surface of the endothelial cells. As soon as you move them out, into the interstitial space, they get terribly excited because they get to meet two new molecules that they were never ever allowed to see before. They get to meet collagen, which is all over the place in the interstitial um, fluid, and they also get to meet tissue factor, or factor free, which is on the surface of all peripheral cells within the body. Okay, now both collagen and tissue factor activate coagulation cascades, okay, which are just chain reactions, basically, uh, which lead to uh, the conversion of a protein known as fibrinogen, also known as factor 1, into fibrin, known as factor 1A, um, which is then assembled into polymers. So the overall result of this is that you produce these massive great strands of fibrin, known as fibrin strands. And these fibrin strands all intertwine with each other to create an incredible meshwork of fibrin. And imagine a really dense spider's web. That's what you're creating, basically. Um, and this will encapsulate this microbe, basically, and trap it 
okay? So that's the purpose of bringing in the coagulation factors to build this incredibly um, dense fibrin meshwork that will contain the uh, pathogen, um, basically, and stop it from spreading to other portions of the body. Okay, right. So, uh, that's the purpose of increased vascular permeability, so that you can build an inflammatory exudate which will be capable of both attacking the pathogen because of the complement and also uh, confining the pathogen because of the coagulation factors. Okay, now the other thing that you do in the acute inflammatory response is leukocyte recruitment. Okay, so you want to move white blood cells uh, from the bloodstream into the interstitial space because white blood cells need to come and help you fight this uh, pathogen basically. Okay, so the initial type of white blood cell that you recruit from the bloodstream into the interstitial space is a type of uh, leukocyte known as a neutrophil. Okay, so let me just talk through what a neutrophil is. So a neutrophil, just to move this up a little bit, is basically your pawns of the immune system, okay? So you have some um, very powerful cells in the immune system, and they are like your uh, bishops and your um, rooks and your knights in the chess game, and some maybe even your queens, whereas there are other cells in the immune system which are less powerful, and the neutrophils are like the pawns in chess, basically. They're the things which you send in first. So I always think of the X-Men film, the X-Men 3 film, where Magneto says, um, he holds one of his um, friends back and says, let the pawns go first, okay? Uh, and it's kind of like that. The other cells are waiting back, and the neutrophils are sent in in massive great numbers, because you have a huge number of them circulating within the bloodstream, okay? So you can afford to uh, recruit a huge number of them into the interstitial space and just chuck them at the pathogen, basically. Okay, so, uh, what do these neutrophils look like? Well, basically, they have a rather interesting nucleus. They have what's known as a multinucleated, uh, sorry, mu not mu multinucleated, multi-lobed nucleus. So they're, nu they're not multinucleated. They have one nucleus, but it has a really odd structure. It's in this lobed structure. So this is one nucleus. It's just got this bizarre lobe connected by a tube to another lobe and then to another lobe over here. Okay, now, the number of lobes that a neutrophil nucleus has is not set. The sort of archetypal number is for it to be three lobes. However, this is not set. You will see ones which have four lobes, ones which have five lobes, etc. And for this reason, uh, neutrophils are often also referred to as polymorphs, okay? Poly means many. Morphs means structure. Okay, and even more explicitly, they're sometimes referred to as polymorphonuclear cells. Okay, so, so this should all be one word, it's just it doesn't fit in. So polymorphonuclear cells, which means many shaped uh, nucleus cells. Okay, so cells which have many different shapes for their nucleus. Another name, and well, another but related, different but related name is to call them polymorphonucleosites, okay? So this is really just combining the nuclear and cells together to make polymorphonucleosites. And for this reason, you can see neutrophils referred to as PMNs for short, which stands for polymorphonucleosites. Okay, right. Now, what do these cells do? Well, basically, they are a phagocyte, okay? So let me explain to you the process of phagocytosis. Okay, so they're a phagocyte. So the process of phagocytosis is that if we have our neutrophil here, okay, and here is its multi-lobed uh, nucleus, so there's one lobe, here's the next lobe, and it has another lobe over here, then if we have the microbe coming along, the foolish microbe that was foolish enough to invade our body has come along, and what's going to happen is that the phagocyte is going to have certain receptors on its uh, surface, 
which will bind to molecules on the surface of the microbe. Okay, and now what will happen is that it will form an invagination um, of the membrane around this microbe. So let me show this happening. So here is the cell, okay, and then you're going to form an invagination like so of the membrane, and then the microbe is going to be within this invagination. Okay, so here's the microbe in red, and I always regret showing the principle of phagocytosis with a neutrophil because I have to draw the multi-lobed nucleus continuously. Okay, so here's our multi-lobed nucleus again. Okay, and then what will happen is it will go from, well, from this to this, and then from this it will go on further. And here now it will have this um, invagination pinched off, so you'll pinch off this invaginated bit to make a full-on vesicle within uh, the cytoplasm of the phagocyte, which in this case is a neutrophil. Okay, so here is our multi-lobe nucleus again, of our polymorphonucleoside, or our neutrophil. Okay, and then inside this vesicle now, we've got our um, microbe here. Okay, and what's going to happen now is that you will have other vesicles within this cytoplasm of this phagocyte, and these other vesicles are known as lysosomes, okay? So these, are, these little vesicles down here, those are representing lysosomes. Oh, and by the way, um, this vesicle containing the microbe has a rather nice name. It's known as a phagosome. Okay, so the microbe is contained within the phagosome, within the cytoplasm of the phagocyte. And now what's going to happen is these lysosomes are going to come and fuse with the phagosome in a process known as phagolysosomal fusion. Okay, so you're going to get phagolysosomal fusion, and that will trigger the uh, re whoops, phagolysosomal fusion, and that will trigger the release of the contents of the lysosome um, into um, the phagosome, basically. Now, what is within the lysosomes? Well, the lysosomes are full of enzymes known as lysozymes, which will break the microbe down, okay? So, overall, the process of phagocytosis is this process where the microbe is taken up, it's engulfed into a phagosome within the uh, phagocyte, and then uh, within the phagosome, it is broken down by the fusion of these lysosomes with the phagosome, and they release lysosomes onto the f uh, microbe, and then destroy that microbe. Okay, so this is what you are bringing into uh, the interstitial fluid. You are bringing in cells which are just going to start eating uh, the microbes, basically. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.